Hello everyone and welcome to Eye on China. I'm Liam O'Neill. Thanks for joining us. I hope you find today's episode to be rather entertaining. It's because it's one that could be read as a James Bond type thriller. Criminal undergrounds, seedy characters, connections to world governing bodies, and tons of money. Such is the world in which our main subject of today's episode lived and operated for most of his life, Mr. Xiao Jianhua. Probably you've never heard of him, but he's one of the world's richest people, also maybe one of the most elusive. It's difficult to ascertain his wealth. His main company, Tomorrow Holdings, controls at least dozens of large financial firms, banks, and insurance companies, and an unknown number of other businesses in coal mining, cement, real estate, and rare earths. Estimates of Mr. Xiao's fortune usually hover around a modest six billion or so U.S. dollars, but companies he controls total an astounding 450 billion U.S. dollars, or 30 trillion yuan. That's more than double that of Alibaba and larger than Amazon. But in any case, he's very rich, and more importantly. He's very, very well connected, but now he's on trial. Looking into how he got into this mess gives great insight into China's ruling class, and is certainly connected somehow to the future leadership of the CCP, which of course is to be decided upon this fall during the 20th People's Congress. Before we get into Mr. Xiao Jianhua's life details, let's look at one of his. Favorite places to hang out. For that matter, it's a favorite of many of his class. Let's turn to Hong Kong. Four Seasons Hotel is a 45-story luxury hotel located in the International Finance Center complex, just by beautiful Victoria Harbor. It has a special nickname: the Northward Looking Tower. Among China's many exports are incredibly. Rich people, usually party officials, who are running away from China. Maybe they have ill-gotten wealth. Maybe involved in some other crime. More than likely, they've lost political standing. Whatever the case, they need a low profile for a time. Here, in this building, such people are relatively safe in waiting. They're waiting for the opportunity to perhaps return to China and regain what they lost, or. Waiting for an opportunity to escape to a more remote part of the world, but here they look north to where they came from. Thus, the nickname "Northward Looking Tower." Why here? Well, the building offers a lot: luxury, trustworthy、uh, security, absolute privacy. These are a must. But much more than this is the location. A subway stop in its basement leads directly to the airport. It's the only place in Hong Kong where one can check in early, so this means when bad news arrives, one can pack up and leave almost immediately without even exiting the building. Furthermore, it's right by the world's largest financial district. Within three or four blocks, you can find all sorts of commercial banks, investment banks, world-class law firms, world-class accounting firms, and much, much more. It's perfect for those who need to harvest. Launder or transfer large fortunes. It's also right by the American, Canadian, and British consulates. So, in a worst-case scenario, one can always run there for asylum. In fact, many high-profile people have stayed here before they successfully escaped further, especially when Hong Kong had true judicial independence. But there was one notable exception in recent years. Re-enter our subject for today, Mr. Xiao Jianhua. At daybreak on January 27, 2017, that was Chinese New Year's Eve, police removed the billionaire from Four Seasons Hotel and escorted him back to mainland China. They pushed him out in a wheelchair, covering his head with a blanket. He reportedly told hotel staff on the way out that he needed medical treatment. For five years since, Xiao's whereabouts remained unknown, and the Chinese government never admitted to taking him in the first place. But now, 
at this sensitive time, right before the Communist Party's 20th conference, Xiao Jianhua resurfaces. His court hearing was held on July 4th. There was no mention at all in Chinese media and very little coverage globally. However, behind the silence is a fierce power struggle among the most powerful of elites in China. Xiao Jianhua is an exceptionally smart guy. Born in 1971, he enrolled in China's top university, Beida, or Beijing University, at the age of 15. But it's his smarts in terms of relationship building that got him to where he is. Very early in his adult life, he was making business deals with Communist Party elites. In 2013, for example, one of his companies bought 15 million yuan's stock of an investment company controlled by party chairman Xi Jinping's older sister and her husband. Here's another example. In 2017, one of Xiao's companies, the Pacific Securities, was publicly listed through essentially an executive backdoor order. In China, a company can go public in one of two ways, regular IPO or through reverse takeover, which means the company can acquire an existing public company. Both routes require strict and lengthy processes to gain regulatory approval from China's state council, the highest administrative organ of the central government. Pacific Securities took neither route. The relevant regulatory agency directly ordered the Shanghai Stock Exchange to list the company, bypassing due process. It was one of the clearest demonstrations of collusion between political powers and large amounts of capital in recent years. The details are long, filled with Chinese names that most of us won't recognize and are certainly difficult to verify. We'll sum it up by saying that in order to pull off this maneuver, Xiao bribed many different aristocratic families and high-ranking officials. On the alleged list was party chairman Xi Jinping's brother-in-law. It's vital to note that Mr. Xiao pulled all of this off, this is in 2017, shortly before his arrest or hospital visit from the Four Seasons in Hong Kong. He had been living there since 2014. Why? Because allegedly Chairman Xi Jinping had wanted to arrest him at that time, but he had gotten wind of the news and fled to Hong Kong just hours after Xi made the announcement in a private meeting. All of this according to upper party leaks. So what does this all mean? Well, his story for one sheds a lot of light on Western companies doing business in China. They are either going to fail miserably or survive by learning to navigate the sordid network of the red aristocrats, China's true masters. JP Morgan, for example, paid a $264 million penalty in 2016 for hiring red princelings, a term that describes the children of high-ranking officials through their so-called sons and daughters program. One J.P. Morgan executive in an email said, you all know I have always been a big believer of the sons and daughters program because it almost has a linear relationship to winning deals with Chinese companies. Documents obtained by the U.S. Justice Department even included spreadsheets that listed the bank's track record for converting prince lean hires into direct business deals. A director at the Security and Exchange Commission, Andrew Serenci, said, quote, J.P. Morgan engaged in a systematic bribery scheme by hiring children of government officials and other favored referrals who were typically unqualified for the positions. He said that J.P. Morgan employees knew quite well they were breaking the law, but couldn't pass up, quote, the new deals that were deemed to be too lucrative. J.P. Morgan is far from alone. Starting in 2014, global banking firms and companies, including Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, UBS, HSBC, and Credit Suisse, have all received letters from the SEC seeking information related to their hiring practices in Asia. The practice also goes beyond the banking sector. In March 2016, San Diego-based chipmaker Qualcomm 
reached a 7.5 million settlement with the SEC for, once again, hiring relatives of Chinese officials. Xiao Jianhua's case is still ongoing. One of the many charges is this 2017 case of his company going public illegally that I mentioned. Many anticipate that he's done for, that Chinese trials, especially for the uber wealthy, are always foregone conclusions. But the court procedures and even the outcomes don't really matter to us on the outside. They're not as interesting as the behind the scenes struggles. The second big takeaway for us is that certainly somehow the timing of this trial is related to power struggles directly affecting Xi Jinping's hold on power in the coming months. Frankly, it's not clear whether the trial benefits or hurts Xi Jinping. His family is implicated, but so too are family members of his political enemies. The third big takeaway is this. Big Western business in China is never about serving the customer, building up society, or generally fixing problems. Rather, it's about political connections with the right factions of the party and ultimately going along with the political maneuverings which are high above the law that determine success in that difficult market. Many of our most talented business minds continue to salivate over the potential riches of the Chinese market. But unfortunately, in doing so, the rules-based system that agencies like the SEC try to enforce and that most people expect to exist, at least in some semblance, is eroded in the process. That's all for today's show. From our team of experts at Ion China, thanks once again for joining us. Please like, please share, please subscribe, and please do leave comments below. We like to read them all. We'll see you next time.